Cliff attended my Young Life Club in Beaverton. Um, he came in, but I never met him at the, uh, the first uh, weeks. Uh, his friends had told him, you got to come. It's great. And so he came, but he always stood in the back. Um, he was afraid somehow of meeting me. His uh, relationship with his dad was not close. I think he had a distrust for, for men. Uh, I finally met him in the summer when I worked at Valley Community Presbyterian Church, a uh, youth pastor during the summer, and we went on a bike trip. Uh, we only took 12 guys on those kind of trips, and so he, you know, uh, he couldn't avoid me. And uh, we were riding together, uh, uh, and uh, uh, between gasps for air, he began to open up about his life. Um, he said, you know, my friends always spoke in glowing terms about you, Ron, but, uh, you know, I was afraid to meet you. Uh, he said, you know, I've, uh, I've, I have, you know, not a very good relationship with my dad. I hardly ever see him, and it's been abusive, and uh, uh, so, I don't know, it just makes me afraid. And uh, uh, he said, I, I've been through the whole drug and drinking scene. Um, but, uh, you know, he knew next to nothing about God and Christ. He, he, no religious upbringing in his family. So I think he had a sense of kind of feeling embarrassed. Uh, but um, after the bike trip, uh, he was no longer afraid of me. And so he began to drop by my house and we'd have conversations. And one time I said to him, Cliff, are you ready to give your life to Christ? And he said, yes. And with tears streaming down his face, he asked Jesus to forgive him and to come into his life. As he drove off that day, I said, God, it does not get any better than this. To take a kid that knows next to nothing about Christ for 18 years of his life and then to lead him to Christ. I think I was born for this. And from that moment on, I decided I was going to become a pastor. I wanted to lead a church that leads people of all ages to Christ. And so I began to make plans to go to seminary. Connecting people to Jesus, that's what fires me up to go to work in the morning. What is it for you? What fires you up to go to school or work in the morning? How did you end up in the field of work that you're in? Whether you're a retail manager, a stockbroker, an architect, a marketing director, a real estate agent, a lawyer, a doctor, a computer engineer, a bus driver, a police officer, uh, an administrative assistant, a grocery clerk, a teacher, a preschool worker, a salesperson, or a small business owner. I bet there was a cataclytic event in your life that caused you to decide, I was born for this. My guess is that event has been a catalytic event that has helped you when you face problems and challenges in your life. All of us need a reason to do what we do. So it behooves, behooves us to review every once in a while why we're doing what we're doing. We also need to review how what we're doing fits in with God's grand design. God has a grand design for every human being in this world. And so maybe you're not a follower of Christ. But it would be good for you to figure out, well, what is God's grand design and how do I fit into that? God has called us to fulfill his grand plan for the world. What is God's divine calling for us? What's God's mission for us? Some of Jesus' final words to his disciples were, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. We're called to be on mission with Jesus to make disciples. Parents, it's important for you to talk about this with your children so that they don't end up pouring their lives into something that really ultimately doesn't matter. Teenagers, singles, marrieds, 
empty nesters, we all need to reflect on how what we're doing is fulfilling God's mission for the world. Patrick Lencioni spoke at uh, the Global Leadership Summit this summer in Chicago. He talked about his book, his latest book, Motive. He starts out the book and says, a lot fewer people in the world should be leaders. <laughs> what a great way to start a book. I mean, most people think they, they should be leaders. I mean, if, if somebody compliments you and your, on your team or your work group or your family and says, you're a leader, you consider that, uh, you know, a, a, a high compliment. But Lencioni says a lot fewer people should seek to be leaders in the world. He says if your motive is off, you shouldn't be a leader. He said there are two reasons to become a leader. One is to do what you must do to help people. He calls that servant leadership. The other reason to be a leader is reward-centered leadership. You do that to get attention or status or rewards. He says that's not the way to lead. He shares five things in his book reward-centered leaders won't do. One thing they don't like to do is to manage their direct reports. They say nobody wants to be micromanaged, so I just let them kind of go. But as Lencioni says, people want to have a relationship with their supervisor. They want to know that what they're doing matters. Second thing the, they won't do is they don't prepare good meetings. He says one of the important things a good leader does is lead good meetings. Another thing reward center leaders don't want to do is have difficult conversations. If there's a problem with the staff person, they would just rather avoid it and not deal with it. And another thing they don't want to do is repeat themselves. But good organizations understand we have to repeat the purpose of the organization. Our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we have a pathway for doing that. Follow Jesus. We want people that don't know Jesus to give their lives to Christ. Come to know him. Be changed by Jesus. We want people to learn how to read the Bible and reflect on it. Learn how to pray. Get involved in a group or get involved in serving so that they can come to know Jesus better and be changed by him. And then finally, we want people to be on mission with Jesus. We want you to know as you go out from here that you know not enough about Christ that you can share Christ with other people. You're on mission throughout the week to make a difference in other people's lives. Mission is not only for the spiritually elite or the well-rested, or people with the gift of gab, or people with outgoing personalities, or for those with theological training. It's for every person who belongs to Jesus Christ. It's because God is by nature ascending God. He never blesses us without also sending us out to bless other people. The first and great example of this is the father of all the faithful, Abraham. Turn to Genesis 12 in your Bible or our Bibles under the chairs. We read how God called Abraham to serve him. It's now become our divine calling. God begins with the mandate. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. And so he leaves Mesopotamia kind of... Uh, in the Middle East, eastern side, and he goes to the land of Canaan, which is modern-day Israel, a little larger than that. Then he gives a promise. The promise is the most famous part of this divine calling. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. Uh, God promises to bless Abraham and to make him into a great nation. In Genesis 15, God tells Abram to look into the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he says, so shall your offspring be. 
Uh, the promise is all the more intriguing when you realize at this point, Abraham and Sarah were childless. And they're getting up there in years. I can imagine uh, uh, Abram talking back to God, say what? A great nation's going to come from me? Uh, God, you may have missed it, but at this point, we have zero children. None. I mean, we've tried for sure, and it's been fun trying, but we've got exactly nothing to show for it. Now I'm 75 years old, and you're telling me we're now going to have children? Surely you don't expect us to start having kids now. God promises to bless Abraham's people, so they become a source of blessing to all people. All people in the world are part of this promise through Abraham, so you can find your divine calling right here in this text. Your divine calling is to bless people in Jesus. God's been good to you, blessed you. Now you're, now you're to go and bless other people in Jesus. The reason you do it is because of Jesus. It's because of God's love for you, you want to go out and care about other people. So his promise is, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. Through the Old Testament scriptures, the New Testament scriptures, and the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached throughout the world, the whole world has been blessed. Most hospitals and most schools and most legal systems trace their roots to the influence of the Old and New Testaments and the Christian faith. Since the promise of Genesis 12 states that all people in the world will be blessed through the people of Israel, it means that if you choose to become a follower of Christ, you become an inheritor of God's divine calling to Abraham. Your divine calling is to bless people in Jesus. How can we best fulfill our divine calling? Let me suggest three ways. One, experience God's blessing. God tells Abraham that he will bless him. And then he asks Abraham to become a blessing to others. God blesses us, then we bless other people. That's always the way it works. We receive, then we give. Apostle John understood this when he wrote, we love because he first loved us. The way to begin experiencing God's blessing is by committing your life to Christ. You say, I believe you're the son of God. Would you come into my life and forgive my sins? And you begin to experience God's presence in your life, his blessing. We read about Jesus meeting a woman in John chapter 4. She was a Samaritan woman. Jews had no relationship with Samaritans. They despised them. But here's Jesus, a Jew, talking to a Samaritan woman. He's talking to her and he says, go get your husband. And she responds, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you're right. Actually, you've had five husbands and the man you're now living with is not your husband. He said this without an ounce of judgment or condescension. And so she ran off to town. She says, come meet the man who told me everything I've ever done. She was blessed by Jesus, and then she blessed others. Two, go. Genesis 12, verse 1, and God says, go from your country and your people to the land I will show you. He asks Abraham to leave his country <clears throat> his uh, <clears throat> personal and emotional security. After I had that experience of leading Cliff into a relationship to Christ and I decided, I, I think I want to be a pastor. I think God can use me this way. Um, then I had to decide where to go to seminary. Well, growing up in the Bay Area of San Francisco, it seemed most likely I'd go to seminary, some school in California. Or I came to college in Portland and I led a Young Life Club here, so going somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. But a couple people said to me, I think you should go to Trinity. 
I was, because I worked at Valley Community Presbyterian Church, I was planning on becoming a Presbyterian pastor, and I knew many Presbyterian churches had moved liberal in their theology, and so I wanted to make sure I got a strong evangelical uh, education so I, I'd be strong in that denomination and and people suggested Trinity and so I, I, I studied it and I learned that they were on the cutting edge of, of evangelical thought they had all kinds of debates between uh, atheists and, and their professors and uh, they had uh, uh, conferences there with all famous people around the world and 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 uh, so I decided I would go to Trinity in Chicago I left all the people I knew in the San Francisco area and Portland and went to a city I'd never been to before. I left sunny California for a wintry winter in Chicago. I left what was familiar to me and followed what I believe God wanted me to do and went to Chicago. In hindsight, I believe that God not only wanted me to get an education there, but he was going to introduce me to Jory there because she lived in Chicago. God calls Abraham as well to leave what he was familiar with and go. Here's an outline of Abraham's life. Go. Where? I'll tell you later. Just go. You will have a son. How? I'll tell you later. Just trust. Offer your son on the mount. Why? I'll tell you later. Just climb. In verse 4, so Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Abraham was 75 when God called him <clears throat> to his greatest mission. I don't find anything about retirement in the Bible. I think some people pull the plug way too early in life. Uh, if you're healthy... And you can still contribute something to this world? Why quit? I'm not saying you can't stop working for a wage-paying job. But some people conclude, you know, that it's time for them to stop working in the church. They've done their church part. And now they're just supposed to travel all the time. That's crazy. The church needs you more than ever. You have experience. You have wisdom. We are on mission with Jesus until the day we die. By the way, if you're a younger person, people in this church that are over 60 will not give you any advice. We feel like it's not our business to nose into your life. But if you ask a question, you'll find that we're happy to talk about from our experience. Verse 5, he took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel. By the way, I've been pleasantly surprised. The last couple of weeks I announced that Jory and I will be taking a trip to Israel in 18 months, uh, late April of uh, 2021, and 52 of you have responded that you're interested in that, uh, and so we'll be, be doing that trip. Uh, we'll see these kind of places. Uh, then they went west to Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. You may respond that Abraham's call was unique. His call to leave his homeland and go into uncertainty was only for him. But God calls all of us to go. The writer to the Hebrews says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not, did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Why did he do it? 
For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. He realized that God's kingdom is the only foundation that lasts. It is only God's approval, God's protection, and God's internal inheritance that are permanent. So if we think we might look foolish talking to a friend at school or work about our faith in Christ or talking to our parents or our children or grandchildren about what we believe about Christ, we're just obeying the same calling God gave Abraham to go into insecurity. God calls us to be a blessing to our city, to our schools, our places of work, our neighborhoods, our families. In Jeremiah 29, the prophet Jeremiah offers some interesting advice to the Jews who had been taken out of Jerusalem, Judah, <clears throat> into captivity in Babylon. He says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. These are the people that become the Samaritans, by the way. So there are Jews that go to, uh, into captivity and they, and they married among uh, the Assyrian people, the Babylonian people. And then when they came back, the Jews looked down on them for like being half-breeds. He says, also... Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will, be, will prosper. This had to be an enormous shock to the people. Remember, the people of Babylon had destroyed Jerusalem. And they'd killed many of the people there and, and taken many others into exile. Many of them had blood on their hands. And now God has the audacity to say to pray for them. Seek their peace and prosperity. We always, uh, it's always easier to withdraw. Many Christians today just kind of pull back. They say, you know, it's not politically correct to talk about religion, to talk about faith in Christ. So I'll just keep to myself. But God calls us to be involved wherever we live. We're supposed to be involved in the political process. We're supposed to be working to make this a better city. It's always easier to withdraw and do nothing. But God says, make a difference where you are without compromising your faith. Three, share God's blessing. God blessed Abraham. Then he called him to bless others. God has blessed you, now he calls you to bless others. When God calls us to be a blessing, he uses the Hebrew word barak. It literally means knee. When it's used of God blessing us, it literally means for God to bend down low on his knee and to help us, to serve us. That's what he did when he sent Christ into the world. He sent his son into the world to show him who he was and to die for us. It always has a sense of God getting down where we are to serve us. If you're going to be a blessing to other people, you have to get down there with them and serve them. You have to be a friend to them. Don Everts and Doug Shop, in their book, I Once Was Lost, What Postmodern Skeptics Taught Us About Their Path to Jesus, they interviewed hundreds of postmoderns who became Christians. Said, you know, how did it happen for you? And they found that one of the key things uh, that led to their progress from not having faith to faith was coming into a relationship, a friendship with a Christian. They said, once I came into a friendship with a Christian, things began to gain traction quickly. They moved from distrust to trust. In years past, God and religion enjoyed the general respect of our culture, but not today in our secular culture. When I, I tell people today that I'm a Christian, I can see almost a, a, a response in their body to, to go from relaxed to, to tense. They're wondering, what have I just told him before about my life? That he, you know, it's because thoughts come into their mind like Christians are self-righteous. They always think they're better than me. I'm about to get judged. 
Christians are narrow-minded. If you want to go beyond trust or, or distrust, you have to come near them and be a friend. Being a friend is one of the most important things you can do to bless people in the world. We have to come near people and serve them. Everts and Shop found that when postmoderns came to Christ, that somewhere along the line, they moved from complacent to curious. Through a relationship with a Christian, they became curious about Christ. So when you begin a relationship with somebody who may be far from God, if they see something different about you that's appealing to them, their curiosity will be piqued. Jesus made people curious. His lack of judgment toward the, the woman from Samaria made her very curious. Another thing that people did that made people curious was ask questions. Jesus has asked 183 questions in the Gospels. He answers just three of them. And he asks 307 questions in return. I think if our relationship with people, we should serve them more and speak less. And when we do speak, we should ask more questions. What kind of questions should we ask? Here are a few that Everts and Shop suggest. Have you ever felt like you received a sign from God? Most people say they've had an experience in life where it seems like a sign to them. What is your take on this whole God question? What do you think is wrong with Christians today? What do you think life is about? Do you think that people are more spiritually interested today than they were five years ago? What is the most significant thing that has happened to you lately? Tell me your philosophy of life in one sentence. Your divine calling is to bless people in Jesus. You say, if I'm going to be a blessing to people, where do I start? I say start small. Some people think if they're going to be, uh, make a difference in this world, they have to go big. They want to take on something like world hunger, and then they look at it, and it's so overwhelming, they don't do anything. What's wrong with just blessing one person? How about blessing the person that comes into your house to make a repair? Think about the person at work or at school who is struggling. Think about the person in your home, your family, that needs your help. Reflect on what it is that gets you up in the morning. My experience with Cliff showed me that I get fired up by connecting people to Jesus. What is it that fires you up? God wants you to use your passion to be a blessing to the world. Your divine calling is to bless people in Jesus. Are you a blessing? Pray with me. Father, thank you for this call you made to Abraham years ago to leave his homeland and go to a new land and that through him you were going to bless the whole world and you've done that. And you call us today to the same process to experience your blessing and then go and share that blessing with other people. We want to do that. If you want to tell God that today, that you want to be a blessing to somebody this week, would you pray that right now? Just kind of tell him you, you want to be looking for who you can bless this week and you want to do that. If you've never given your life to Christ, you could do that right now. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. Would you come into my life, forgive my sin, and live in me? I'll give you a, just a minute now to pray. Father, thank you for being so good to us, blessing us, being merciful to us. And now we see that you call us to go and be a blessing to other people, our neighborhoods, our families, our places of work, our schools. And we offer ourselves to you this week to do just that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.